question of the in this particular case because of the participation of the local uh, folks we wanted to make sure that they had a chance to do theirs without waiting until the end of the foundation meeting uh, so that's why the um, uh, organization is that is it uh, so with that welcome let me first ask if there are any declarations of conflicts for today's meeting uh, hearing none, I believe Andrew has something short he would like to explain. Uh, yeah, so there, there is one other thing. Um, some of you will be aware we have a, a reallocation of some responsibilities that will be starting in January. For the most part, that doesn't actually have any effect on people's jobs, but there are two exceptions to that. Um, and that is Sally and Renalia who are here with us today um, and who will be leading a number of the discussions rather than me. So I just wanted to make clear why that was happening. Um, there's nothing weird about it. That's in fact our plan for how things are going to go forward in the future. And I wanted to make sure that everybody understood why that's happening. Uh, so, you know, this is part of the reallocation of responsibilities that is happening at the beginning of the year. That is not really changing the way the Internet Society works, but this is the exception to that. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, as you will note from the agenda, our next uh, scheduled speaker would be Lars Eggert. Unfortunately, Lars is down with COVID. Uh, so uh, we'll receive a written report from him in the future. Uh, that means our next speaker is Mirja Kulovin, uh, as chair of the Internet Architecture Board. Mirja. Yes, good morning, everybody. And uh, greet greetings from Lars. I just was chatting with him, so he's well up. Uh, I did send some slides. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm send a few more slides uh, as I'm here, so you have a chance to ask questions, uh, and we have maybe a bit of discussion if you want. Um, also, if you have any general um, questions about the IETF or the IHT, I can try to answer them as well, even so last is not here. Okay, I can can keep talking. <laughs> I'm waiting for the slides. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, so that's a report from the Internet Architecture Board. That means I'm focusing on topics that the Internet Architecture Board is working on, and we can go to the next slide, I think. Um, just for uh, people who are maybe not completely aware what the Internet Architecture Board is doing, uh, which is like often the case, um, the Internet Architecture Board is one of three leadership groups in the IETF. The other one is the IHG that is led by Lars, and then is also the LSC Board, um, which was established only a few years ago when we reorganized. Um, the responsibility for the IAB is um, there's a couple of like formal things we're doing, like um, selecting and confirming people in certain positions. Um, we um, are responsible for the oversight of the standards process and liaison management. So this is like including appeals. And there was also some responsibilities for uh, the RFC series, which we just reorganized. So I should update the slide. <laughs> Not true anymore, but we are the touch point for IENA at least. We are also the um, contact point for ISOC. Um, and then there's a bunch of technical things that we're trying to do, uh, which we call architectural oversight, which basically means um, that we have a group of experts um, who try to figure out in the IETF if there are any topics uh, that need more discussion, that need more extent, uh, attention, um, that are not well addressed yet. Okay, next slide. This is the current IAB. Um, we have 12 members that are selected by the NOMCOM, by the community, and then we also have the IETF chair, Lars, and the IRTF chair, um, Colin, as members of the IAB, and I'm, as the chair of the IAB, I'm selected by the members of the IAB. Next slide. Um, we submit a report in a written form um, before I every IETF meeting. Um, I think you received the report already, and you can download it in the proceedings of the IETF meeting. Um, and this has like all the official stuff that we're doing, all the statements, all the appointments, everything, if you want like the full list. Um, just very quickly, maybe some things that might be of interest for you. We just published two reports uh, from two workshops that we held last year. So those are ready and, and if you want to read them. And there's one document that's coming up about um, an architectural consideration, which will be published very soon. Next. Um, yeah, more interesting is maybe this one. This is a very recent research uh, workshop that was held a few weeks ago. The focus was on management and encrypted um, network or management of encrypted traffic. 
and this is an ongoing discussion. Um, with this workshop, we were trying to not talk too much about like, why do you break our systems when encrypting your traffic? It's more about like, what can we actually do? Like, how can we help you? How can we um, change network management and these kind of mechanisms to make them work with encrypted traffic and make them also work in a more secure internet? Um, there were no concrete like action items that came out of this workshop, but we had a really good um, discussion a better understanding among the participants and also an understanding that this is not an easy task and there will not be like one solution that fits all. We have to look at every problem separately and find a good solution for it. So recordings are online, uh, papers are online, slides are online, and the report is hopefully coming very soon. Next one. The, there is an upcoming workshop very soon uh, in the first week of December. Does it not say this on the slide? Yeah, it does say it at the, at the, bottom, at the top. Um, so we received a bunch of submissions, like more than 30 um, submissions. So there's a lot of interest in this topic about our envi environmental impact. And we mainly trying to figure out what is the impact of the internet? Like how can we measure it? What does it mean? And is there something we need to do? So let's see what will happen there. Next slide. As we're talking about important technical topics, I would just want to out outline, we have these weekly calls, they are open for observers, observers um, if you're interested in it. But the interesting part here is that once a month, we actually do a call that is focusing on technical topics only. And this just gives you a quick list of like technical topics that we had over the uh, last couple of months. So there was something on interdomain routing security. This is not a new topic, but still an open problem. And we're trying to figure out if there's maybe an, a way to like address this problem again or like now maybe there, there are different things that we can do now than like <laughs> over the last couple of years. Um, we had a discussion about limited domain. This is something that comes up very often in the IETF where people say we want to operate this protocol in a limited domain so it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to have the same properties. When we say it's actually better to develop a protocol that is can be used in a widespread scenario and is very safe and has all the properties that we also would expect from, from an internet protocol. You have a question from Barry. Ah, sorry, I didn't see that. Hi, this is Barry Lieber. Are, are these technical topics announced or could they be announced on the IETF announce list? They are currently not announced. We decided that we don't want to spam the list by announcing all our calls, but maybe only announcing the technical ones might be a good idea. Okay, I will keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, limited domain. So the, the question was like, is there actually something special? Um, that's an ongoing discussion still. We talked a lot about data privacy. This is a, a topic that comes up very often and for different protocols. And there's a new document um, out there talking about the privacy partitioning principle. Uh, centralization is a topic that we've been talking about a lot over the last couple of years. And we have a document which is not written by the IAB, but like the, supported by the IAB, written by a community member um, that we try to move forward. And then we had this invited talk about partial internet connectivity uh, based on a paper from John Heidemann, which was also a very interesting discussion about what, what is the internet actually? What does it mean to be connected? Which kind of properties do you have to have to say you're connected to the internet? Okay, next slide. Um, Technical work, we have a couple of technical programs. Actually, we only have one at the moment. We closed the other one. But on this slide, I actually would put your attention um, on, the, on the lower part. We uh, also have these, what we call administrative support groups. So that's really just to support um, the IAB in their responsibilities, uh, where we need additional members. And we have two new groups. So uh, we have a group that existed basically forever for coordination between the IETF and the IETF. IEEE, um, just like now it has a formal home and is more visible. And the interesting part for you might be that we also now created a, a formal group for the coordination between IB and ISOC policy coordination. Um, so that that's means that we do like calls from time to time, like once per meeting cycle or once per month or whatever, we have to figure out how we handle that. So we have like a few more people focusing on, on discussions uh, and, and touch points between IB and ISOC. So just to, to confirm a little bit about that, is that something that's being coordinated through the um, people who are the observers at the Internet Architecture Board from ISA? Yes, so the members of this group are um, the liaison that we already have in the IAB, some members from the IB, some members from the IHG, and then what we do, depending on the topic, we also invite other people from ISOC to join, for example, um, to give us more information about last time we were talking about the IGF, 
or um, other other meetings where ISOC has like more expertise than than we have. Thank you. Um, next slide. Talking about policy, we recently, um, and you find this in the report, I just wanted to say quickly, we recently published a bunch of, of statements uh, where we comment on uh, um, calls for input from uh, different organizations. And uh, we do this kind of on a little bit of random basis. It's like if an IB member comes up and says, this is important, we should do something, we might do it. Um, but this is also one of the things where this ISOC uh, coordination group might be very helpful to like detect those things, but also like if both groups, the IB and ISOC, reply to a response, that we at least know about it and maybe have a chance to talk about it and are to some extent aligned about it. It doesn't mean that we have to say the same thing, but at least we should be aware what the other group is saying. Next. Um, yeah, and talking about policy, uh, this may be also interesting for you and their recordings of the discussions. Um, we ha have this IOB open meeting, which we do for like maybe two years now. It's just another way to engage with the community, get feedback, have a discussion. But what we also did for the last two meetings were inviting um, speakers and these topics were like to some extent policy related and because we thought that's actually good forum for us. So um, this meeting we had two talks about censorship in Iran, really good talks, like if you're interested in it, um, watch the recording, it was, was a really nice session. Um, and, and I think it was very well received, I, I got a lot of positive feedback, but of course there were also a few people saying why do we have these kind of talks in the ITF, why do we need to care? Um, but I think it's a, it's a positive way uh, forward to bring up attention to these topics. If we do something or not, it is a different question. And like at least leadership was very positive about this as well. Especially this talk from Marsha, um, that's the second speaker here. Um, she she explained very well like what happened in Iran over the last couple of years on like censorship, how they developed the technique, and what are the kind of censorship they are applying right now from a technical point of view. But she also made a request at the end that the ITF should do something to circumvent censorship and I think like bringing this to the ITF and starting a discussion is actually a nice thing. Um, the, the talk from last time about the uh, Digital Market Act, um, that one was also very well received, uh, was a, a professor with a economics and law based uh, background who was also um, an, an advertising role to and on advertising and, <laughs> and uh, consulting role to the EU. Um, so he could explain this very well. And it's very relevant for our work because there's now the Mimi um, working group, which is like motivated by, by these uh, things in policy. Okay, I have one more slide or maybe actually two more slides. Um, just quickly to mention, we had two side meetings this time. These were not organized by the IAB, um, but um, there are touch points here and we were aware of these side meetings. So there was one um, side meeting organized by the uh, DCMS together with ISOC to uh, have a meetup with policymakers, with local policymakers mainly. So this happened because um, DCMS actually came to us and to ISOC and said like, you are in London, so we should like make use of that. And this was now organized as like a public site meeting. So everybody could join. It was on our site meeting agenda, which is a little bit hard to find, but it's publicly visible and was basically a panel between um, somebody from the DCMS and Lars, me and Colin and have a discussion about how we can communicate in future and like what are the touch points basically. I think that was received positively and we we've been we are talking with ISOC to restart the policy program and also figure out if like a forum like that is interesting for the future as well. So thank you for the support there from ISOC. I think this is uh, really good to have this. And there was a second meeting that was organized um, by Article 19 and, and the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, so very similar format, but like actually a closed meeting. So it was not on the agenda, it was only invited people. And there was not only a panel discussion, but also some drinks. So like in a meetup meet up, um, session. Um, but also uh, a little bit discussion about how, how the ITF works and why, why people should be involved or uh, these kind of things, um, just to make you aware. Next and final slide, hopefully. Yeah, so um, this one I just wanted to point out because um, Ted reached out to the IAB um, informing us that you had a discussion uh, about attacks on the internet uh, or impacts on the internet and I sent a small reply already but maybe this is something we want to discuss now and um, we had a discussion about that at the last ITF meeting in July or not about that but like about 
um, internet governments in general and in, in, in any kind of yeah, attacks or dangers there. And that was triggered by a paper that was kind of actually proposing to have like some more overarching government uh, group or whatever. Um, and uh, the outcome for, of our discussion was mainly that um, we should maybe put more effort in explaining how the current government system works and that all these different groups actually like have a very defined role and they work well together and, and, and what the principles are behind this and also the principles of the internet and what will break if you change the system. So what we're trying to do um, with very slow progress <laughs> is to write like a document that um, explains these things and then points to existing RFCs or existing documents as much as possible as well. But having everything in one place and also publish it more like a white paper style thing and not like an RFC. So it's maybe more accessible to, to a different audience. So that's our plan. Um, but if you have more input, um, I'm happy to hear it. Or maybe this is actually a topic where we should have a broader discussion at another point of time and, and take some time for it. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I noticed that the, at the end, you were talking about a, a broader joint discussion. Uh, that was one of the things the IAB suggested in its response to uh, the Board of Trustees question on uh, how to make effective some of these discussions of defending the internet. Uh, and I think there was a positive reception from uh, several members of the board that scheduling a joint discussion would be um, a great idea. I, I will say that I think that the obvious time to do it would be something like the overlap time between the board of trustees meeting and uh, uh, and an ITF, and the next time that will happen will be in Yokohama. So we we could aim for that. There is a bit of a uh, a point about that, though, that I'll make. So we might want to do it one in advance of that, with just a, a regular call, um, a little bit easier to schedule and a great deal faster. And that is the other is that at the end of an IETF, the IEB tends to be very, very tired. <laughs> it does a lot of work over those days. Um, and so uh, having a, a deep policy discussion when people are ready to go out for um, uh, an ice cream cone and uh, a, a nice sit, um, is probably not going to be the most effective. So we'll we'll be in touch about scheduling that. And I think probably at least initially we might do that uh, on a call, either one of our calls or one of your calls, um, and we'll work from there. And I, I think one of the questions you asked in that was whether or not it would be a public call. Um, generally speaking, the Board of Trustees does as much as it can uh, in public. Um, but if the IEB feels that there are things that it wants to discuss in camera, you can let us know and we can have an executive session for that as well. Yeah, actually for us, our discussion happened to happen at the last ITF meeting. And when we meet in person, these are actually not public calls. So, but I, yeah, I have to go back to the IB and check out what they want. Any other questions for Miriam? Laura. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to see if we could get a copy of your slides. I know we have the report, but you mentioned um, one particular talk that you thought would be good for people to watch, um, which is linked in there and I would like that. So if you could send those, that would be terrific. Are the yeah. slides on? I, I just sent the last update oh. this morning, but you should get them eventually. That's okay. I did not see them. Thank you. Sorry. From me. The, the, the update this morning. <laughs> just in time. Um, any other questions for me? A remote. Uh, go ahead. Okay. My apologies. Um, just uh, well done, but that was a mistake on my part, sorry. I, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Can you say again? Okay, so my system was malfunctioning, so it was a mistake um, raising my hand in the first place. My apologies. Let's oh, move no, on. No worries. Um, uh, thanks for being here as an observer. Okay, well, thank you again, Maria, for coming and for, for the report, um, and we look forward to the uh, further discussion. Thank you. Then I will leave you and enjoy your meeting. I'm just happy to go home. So. <laughs>
bigger. So I can select the leg and I should. Are those visible? Yes, they are. Excellent. Okay, um, I'm covering the presentation today. Uh, Glenn was unable to make it. So I'll walk through the slides. These are the same ones that um, folks would have seen earlier this week at the uh, plenary. So I'll do my best to represent um, um, the data. I am the newest member of the trust having come in during the summer. Um, and so here we go. And uh, sorry, got to get to the next slide. The trust is made up of five members. This is uh, the formation of the IATF trust since the IASA two changes a couple of years ago. Three of the members, which include Glenn Dean, Kathleen Moriarty, and Joe Halpern, are nominated through the standard IATF nomcom, and they serve uh, a rotating three year. There's a three year um, uh, commitments for each one of those appointments. Uh, Stephen is uh, the member currently on the trust as appointed by the ISG, and I'm currently on the trust as of this year as appointed by the Board of Trustees, uh, the ISOC Board of Trustees. The purpose of the IHF trust, and this is something that's been uh, not always well known by all the members of the IHF and across the greater community, but in short, uh, the next couple of slides will kind of walk through what the trust is supposed to effectively do. What's the core responsibility of the trust? Um, it's effectively there to manage IP assets and to enable those uh, and to protect the ownership and to be able to enable use of those assets. And when we say IP in this context, um, since this is the Internet Standards Committee, it's intellectual property, not the protocol we know, know and love. And uh, these hold IP assets for ITF, IANA, ICANN, and in the Internet community. Um, this includes things like domain ownership, as you can see there from the, the list uh, in the bullet points. It includes copyrights, I like IETF logos, photos, videos. Uh, an example of that that was brought up the other day is, you know, as normal business goes on through the IETF meetings, there might be photographs taken from members or various uh, uh, scenarios, and all of those are included in the, the assets that would be uh, managed by the IETF trust. Uh, there are granted rights that are part of the overall IETF process as per uh, RC 5378. Uh, there are trademarks that are part of the assets that are protected or managed through the IETF trust. And then obviously software artifacts like the uh, IETF tools, IETF Yang catalog, and, and such items there. So this is like a general overview of the types of things that the trust would uh, caretake as part of that duties. Um, a bit of a pictorial to describe, um, and, and this is probably the best picture I've seen so far to kind of describe some of the contributions and how that relationship works with the community. As the community does, uh, you know, as there's ongoing work within the community, there's these contributions and uh, a lot of ideas. Um, if you look at the top part of the diagram, goes towards the ITF, as, uh, the ideas go to the ITF, there are goals, contributions. And uh, there, there's a cyclical relationship with the IETF and the IETF trust in terms of our RFC copyrights that are part of that, but then there's the right to use um, of, those, of those rights. And then there's granted rights as per RFC 5378, which go um, to the trust and granted towards the IETF trust. And those are licensed out. Now, there's a effective um, pattern of you know, grants, uh, grants are, really there for everyone to use, but they still need to be managed uh, through and uh, the actual trust themselves. So that's a kind of like a basic overview of um, the functions of the ITF trust. Um, some updates since IETF 114, uh, the LS4 badge artwork um, has uh, assignment was completed. Um, another large change that occurred over the last a couple of months is there's been a change in legal representation. There was a need for that based on the previous representation was representing both the IETF and the trust. And there seemed to be some challenges with that, or at least not being able to represent it in, in the best way. So uh, there's a there's new representation uh, with Andy Optigrove, who's now, now on board to represent the trust. Um, 
There's been some corrections to RFC citations in the trust FAQs. The next slide will go into um, just those, those updates. And uh, a conversation that's actively underway, and there was a meeting even earlier this week on some of those points, uh, was, uh, is the restructuring of the actual IATF trust. That's currently um, active work. Um, just to briefly, uh, this is a co compilation of some of those uh, changes to the FAQs. Um, there was an error made in, in the FAQ around TLP modification um, that was reported. There's been some corrections to uh, citations to 30, uh, RFC 3978 um, uh, with respect to RFC 5378. And uh, there's a link here with um, the old and new text updates so uh, people can go and reference those for themselves and see those updates. The restructuring, um, just to give you actually background. So currently the trust today is a, is a Virginia trust. Um, it, it's set up as an actual trust and the trustees hold personal liability as part of their roles in the trust. And so there's a move towards um, a corporation. Here you note that it shows Delaware Corporation. Often in, in the US, um, the state you choose um, is particular to the, um, it, it just basically defines the, the case law around um, <clears throat> what could be used at, you know, as part of that corporation and if there's any other litigation, et cetera. But the reasons for this conversion is to resolve a few key items which are listed here. One is, uh, trademark uh, registration issues. Um, the second is around obtaining sufficient insurance coverage. This is actually a, one, one key item. Today, uh, insurance has to be purchased uh, um, with respect to the trustees. That's becoming increasingly difficult to do in terms of both opportunity and cost. So that's um, an, another key driver. There's personal and related to that, there's personal liability um, to the actual trustees themselves, which has been you know, an ongoing concern and uh, challenge. And so um, <clears throat> based on that, uh, there's work as noted to uh, convert from the current um, model, which is a Virginia trust to an actual corporation, at which time the trustees would no longer necessarily be personally liable, but they would now be on the corporation. The corporation would then uh, become liable uh, for those, those artifacts and, and IP works. So there's a lot of active work going on right now with respect to uh, getting bylaws set up, how would the corporation be set up, um, et cetera. Um, there's lawyers involved as that gets all written up. The name of the trust uh, had been a bit of a back and forth, i.e. the original discussion was, could we just be called the IETF trust? That seemed to raise a lot of eyebrows um, and was not well re received because trust means something. Um, in certain environments. So the title now agreed to is the IETF Intellectual Property Management Corporation. Seems a bit elongated, but that was uh, what was uh, agreed to. And that will be what will be used to register the corporate name and uh, the various other um, items that are ongoing there. And, um, and you know, will be reflected in corporation documents and bylaws as those are written up. In terms of some of the work ongoing with respect to conversion, here's a bit of a, a chart that itemizes some of those tasks. Um, just for clarity, these tasks are not all serialized. Um, a note I think was supposed to be on the slide, but it is not. These are, uh, but these are just an itemization of various, uh, various, various tasks. Some of these obviously can be done in parallel. So you can see there's still quite a bit of work to do, but a lot of the foundational work has already begun and or been completed. So this is now an old slide, so I'll skip it. This was the office hours from earlier today. And that's the last slide. What I'll do is, I guess we can open up for some quick questions if there are any. Um, there was a one other discussion point I'll probably raise. That, um, on Thursday, there was a meeting with various members of the IATF and the trust discussing funding. One of the challenges around, um, uh, one of the active discussions around funding for the trust is as a nonprofit in the US, the challenge of is there enough diversity of funding 
to maintain that position. I think those on the board would understand that that's an that's a challenge with any um, nonprofit. And so there had been discussions around whether those should be done by the trust themselves, i.e. solicit funding directly to the trust or to leverage the IETF engine to be able to generate those that funding and manage it through there. Um, I unfortunately was unable to make that meeting. Uh, I had some basic updates from there. And I, I think Ted or other members um, that are in the room uh, who may have been there that day may have heard those updates. But my understanding is that right now, there seems to be an overall agreement that leveraging the IETF as the source of those funding and maintaining that as um, the ability to to bring in funds um, seems to be the more preferred method. Um, and that seems to match you know, discussions among the trustees themselves in that body of five members doesn't leave a lot of room to execute on trying to develop a funding model, execute the funding model. Uh, and the trustees, the thoughts are that you know they should be focused in on the actual execution of the trust mandate, which is to manage the IP assets. So that's my last main point. I hope that wasn't too quick. And I was able to go through that material in an understandable way. And now I'll leave room for some questions. Uh, thank you very much. Just two two points. One, uh, in addition to this, there was a discussion as part of the general area dispatch meeting of a document that Lars had written, which was intended to uh, to set out the expectations of the trust. And during the discussion of that, uh, kind of two points came out, one of which was uh, it probably needed to narrow as a document to focus specifically on the expectations from the IETF community since um, uh, post IANA transition, there are some other assets in the trust that relate to IANA. Um, but that once that uh, it was narrowed, it, it was also going to be delayed because they, they felt like uh, <clears throat> attempting to finish that document while the form of the trust was being altered uh, was a little bit difficult to, um, to work through uh, two two different things at the same time, and there there was not sufficient urgency in writing up those expectations to to try and get those done in advance of the the um, uh, the transition. So they'll pretty much wait until the transition is done, uh, and then consider what, if anything, need to be written down about the expectations. On the funding, I did have a conversation with Lars about that, um, and I think that the the issue there is that. Uh, as as Victor notes, uh, hiring a different funding uh, fundraiser for the trust would be both expensive and confusing, um, since uh, it it will have a relationship to the ITF but not be the ITF LLC. Um, the the way forward with that appears to be that they will ask Lee Berkeley to uh, include this within her remit. Uh, as a fundraiser for the IETF, but ask that the funds go directly to this new management corporation as a 501, as a different 501c3, in order to make sure that those funds uh, contribute to the public support test for the 501c3 that, that is being created. Um, so rather than funneling everything through the IETF LLC, uh, instead the IETF LLC will act as um, a, a friendly provider of uh, uh, fundraising uh, uh, services, uh, not a supporting organization, but just a, a helpful helpful friend uh, to do something very similar, but to bring the funding directly into the 501c3. Uh, if they work out a way to make that simpler so that the funds can go directly to the IETF LLC and then be distributed uh, to the trust, they might do that. But the current plan is that the fundraising uh, would be provided on a pro bono basis by the IETF LLC, but result in funds going directly to the trust. Are there other questions or comments about the trust? It's always an exciting topic, Ted, so. Uh, having been on the trust, I, I must say it must have changed a great deal if it's always an exciting trust. Um, uh, so I think uh, as, as folks will know from having looked at the board book, there is, uh, there are a number of reports that we received uh, as written reports as opposed to uh, presentations, uh, one of which was from the IETF LLC, and I believe we're going to look at just two quick pages from that that I wanted to call attention to. Uh, the first of them is in the report as page or slide four, and if you look at that, what you'll see is uh, 
a, a quick review of what the current board work is for the ITF administration LLC. And I wanted to bring this to your attention because of course, periodically we have to uh, appoint somebody to this board. And so it's useful for us to review periodically what they're doing so we know what kind of person to appoint. Uh, as you can see from this, they're working on uh, retrospective on the COVID mitigations. Uh, they're, they're focusing on fundraising. Um, they're working on the IT, with the ITF Trust to support the bootstrapping there, uh, preparing for their budget and looking at uh, what's the new normal for hybrid meeting attendance and how do we adapt? That's one of the big ones because historically, although not all of the funding for the ITF has come from meetings, it has been a significant stream and it hasn't been clear how significant a stream of funding it will be in the future. And the ITF LLC is looking both from an administrative perspective, how big a hotel do we need? How big a conference center do we need? And from a fundraising perspective, uh, this particular meeting actually had over 800 uh, local attendees. Uh, which is a, a big increase over uh, Vienna, which was the first one we did um, uh, that had an in-person component after uh, COVID. So the, the trend line is definitely up, but we don't know where the plateau sits. What was the average uh, So it depended on, on region, but for US 1, 1200, uh, so about two thirds of, of, of what it would have been in the past. Um, so again, Looking at that, what would the venue contracts need to do to evolve to, to take that into account? Um, and also the ITF has had separate COVID guidance for its meetings compared to the, to the local uh, jurisdiction. In particular here, for example, you're required to wear masks in the meeting rooms, uh, except when speaking um, and advised to, to wear masks in any informal discussion, except when eating or drinking. Um, and that's not, the, the local jurisdiction's guidance anymore at all. Uh, it might have been when we first made the decision to come back here, but it has evolved locally, but we did not change. So there's a question, at what point do um, we shift that? Uh, the other thing is it's somewhat difficult for the ITF folks to understand what the local norms are. Our next meeting will be in Japan. And even if the, um, the local law might not require masks, uh, Japanese norms around wearing masks uh, are very, very different from the norms you would find here in London or, or in the US. So I think it's important for us to kind of work through how much of this needs to be um, perhaps more regulated in the ITF community given local norms versus local laws. So that discussion is happening in the ITF LLC. Uh, the other thing uh, on the next page, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I just wanted to give everybody a quick look at their budget. Uh, Victor, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a just quick question on the, the previous slide. Uh, sorry. So you did mention it briefly that, um, but I wanted to just kind of ask it more specifically. How does the does the LLC have an idea of how long they feel that um, COVID specific focus and or mitigation policies will likely be in place? I know it's it's a very open and question hard to answer. Um, just is it something that they feel like it will be an indefinite period of time? Will it be the next couple of years? Or it's more like meeting by meeting type of assessment? I, I don't have uh, any vision into what the ITFLC's view of that is. Barry, did you? Yeah, I talked with Jay about it the other day, actually. So uh, it's certainly something that is revisited meeting to meeting. Uh, part of it is consulting with the community about what the community wants. There's a balance of how many, how much need is there for masks versus how many people will not come if we aren't masked and that sort of thing, trying to maximize the participation in that regard and, and make, uh, and get what the consensus of the community is. So it's, it's being considered meeting by meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we return to the budget slide. Uh, so I, I also just wanted the board to be aware of how their um, current accounts look compared to the budget for the year. Um, this is page five in the uh, in the slide deck if you want to look at it locally. I'm not going to go into this in any detail. I just wanted to call your attention to it. Uh, obviously, there's some red on that. Um, some of that red is investments, um, which has definitely happened to <laughs> not, not, not just the IATF LLC, but far more broadly. Um, so it's uh, it's important for 
for us to be aware of it. I'll also say that uh, there is a big push from the LLC uh, to try and bring in funds uh, through their fundraising efforts while the match that we offered uh, is in place. I think uh, at the at the uh, plenary meeting, uh, Jason pointed out, I think six times, um, given that there are only six slides in this, <laughs> the, fact that, the fact that the match got, got basically a, a mention as many times as there were slides is worth us knowing. They're definitely anxious to take it, take advantage of that. Um, please, if you if you have more questions about the the deck after you've read it, we can uh, take them up on the list. Um, okay, I think our next um, are either the the CHAC or OMAC. Um, have either of those folks joined for the moment? Okay. Um, do we have uh, Olivier at this point? Because we can bring him forward. Okay, uh, so we'll take a short break. Uh, we'll caffeinate and then when the uh, the CHAC or OMAC uh, folks are ready, we will reconvene. So please be ready to come back uh, at the top of the room. Okay. Uh, yep, oh, you're here. Oh, good. I'm sorry. Uh, I think perhaps uh, your um, your indicator in in the video conferencing system didn't tell us that you're here. Uh, so, if you are here, um, are you going to present locally, uh, or would you like us to present your slides? Present it. I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, so we'll go on with those reports now. Then, please begin. Okay. Um, I'm waiting. Could you put up my slides, please, from your end? Yes, just a second, please. Thank you. Okay, so while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, just for those who may be new to CHAC, uh, CHAC is the voice of the chapters to the Internet Society uh, through the president and the CEO, and of course, uh, the board of trustees. Our approach is uh, moving from local to global, um, talking to each representative from each chapter around the world. CHAC SC is actually uh, the steering committee is made up of nine people geographically uh, elected uh, based on uh, their intent to volunteer for the service. So uh, with the support of the, the staff in the ISOC, uh, we've been doing a lot, which um, depends on how we are advised or we are collaborating. Uh, that being said, while still also waiting for the slide to come up on your side, my name is Adebumi Akimbo. I'm speaking from Nigeria. I'm in Africa, and I'm the African non geographical representative. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Adebumi. And I believe that your slides are now ready. Um, just indicate uh, that you'd like them to advance by saying next slide. Yes, thank you. Okay, again, while the slides are still coming up, As of the last year, when we were doing this presentation, we were looking at uh, amending our rules and procedures, which of course we've been able to do with our amendments. Okay, thank you, we're up. Next slide, please. On behalf of the Chapter Advisory Council, I want to say well done to everyone here at the meeting. Next slide. Okay, this uh, members, of, okay, previous slide. Yeah, these are members of the steering committee. I'm the vice chairman. Uh, the press, the chairman uh, is actually unavoidably absent basically because uh, some months ago he was involved in an accident and he's been undergoing some um, hospitalizations and treatment. Uh, we've always wished him speedy recovery. That being said, next slide. 
Okay, so our, as part of our outreach, uh, we've been able to be involved in different regional calls, uh, especially of what you've mentioned is Africa, where we get to call all chapters together and discuss. Of course, uh, the main objective of such calls across continent is to always discuss on how to exchange information, uh, transfer knowledge, and um, sharing basic uh, workable uh, applications of our initiatives and also collaborating at different levels. Next slide, please. As a, as a steering committee, we've been able to discuss issues uh, in the ITU and the UN, uh, which has of course uh, led to a lot of uh, more awareness about the challenges, uh, which is of course the level of entry into such discussion. Uh, what aspect of that discussion are we going to discuss about? How do we approach such discussion? What are the roles of government and how do we approach government in ensuring that the ITU UN discussions uh, become much more useful, you know, enjoying the fact that ISOC represents the voice of the people when it comes to the internet. We are also looking at how to build frameworks to engage chapters uh, either directly through uh, the steering committee or indirectly through the continent. Our achievement in 2002 has basically been a uh, been able to discuss with OMAC, uh, which I believe should be right here, uh, you know, on the board in this meeting. And then staffs have also been successful to share different metrics with us. Next slide. Different metrics with the steering committee to ensure that we understand what the issues are and how to address such issues. Um, in this, early this year, uh, Eduardo Diaz uh, made a request and, you know, talking about interpretations of working committees. The challenge behind this is that ISOC often translates um, all discussions into French and Spanish. So the discussion was basically, uh, should we continue? Uh, would this encourage more people from the French speaking and the Spanish speaking uh, continent uh, to be able to participate? Uh, it's a big challenge basically because um, when it comes to interpretation, uh, it's sometimes very, very expensive to handle and also cumbersome. So agreeably, we looked at it, we put it up for debate. Next slide, please. We put it up for debate. And while debating, we've discovered that um, translation of agenda, translation of notes, translation of comments uh, often raise a lot, excuse me, often raise a lot of issues. Uh, we put it also to a vote and believe that at the, the last meeting where we had a vote, 86.49% uh, people believe we should carry it on with English, uh, thereby you know, being able to cross the challenges we feel we would undergo when it comes to cost and the fact that it becomes, um, it, it slows down the system of discussion, often slows down the system of discussion. Next slide, please. One of our basic topic for the year also included digital sovereignty, uh, which we, we were able to get input from chapters across the globe. Uh, of course, 22 chapters participated and two SIGs uh, also participated. This looks to us like a high number basically because of various meetings we've held, various surveys we've held in the past. And we believe these inputs validates our findings uh, towards understanding and drafting a white paper on digital sovereignty. Next slide, please. So um, from time to time, we have had to discuss issues concerning uh, membership and the growth of chapters across the globe. Fortunately, uh, chapter formation uh, have also come with its own challenges. One of those are geopolitical um, challenges. Next slide. Now, when we say geopolitical challenges, these are you know, concerning countries that often uh, have issues of breaking away with other countries. Uh, you know, without mentioning any country, a country that says it wants to stand alone and believes strongly that by standing alone, it has to give itself a new name. Before now, ISOC has always followed the ISOC, um, ISO 3166 as a standard, which recognized names of country, dependent countries, special areas of geographical interest and their principal uh, subdivision. But in this case, the challenges we are having are countries who do not have such um, standard, who do not follow such standard. 
Uh, the steering committee over the past few months have discussed to a large extent, and we believe that we can come up with these following recommendations, as you can see on the, on the PowerPoint. So the six points are pointing at how to formalize our reference, how to um, be quick about understanding how to handle such new applications when they're going through reviews, uh, if, their, if their formal objectives are taken care of, how about the naming? How do we name them? So these are our own suggestions and we believe that the board could look through them and consider giving us a, a formal support or more advice in moving forward from here. We want to be as apolitical as possible. That's our major objective with this particular challenge, naming challenge. Uh, I'm from Nigeria. Uh, if Nigeria decide, as an example, decides to be in two or three uh, different um, sovereign countries, so, so to say, and Nigeria does not recognize the other two other parts who have decided to take up on a new name, would I still go ahead to recognize those names? And that would um, create a political issue that ISOC would also be involved in if ISOC goes ahead to you know, recognize them. But if I saw choose not to recognize them, we're also denying them of some fundamental human rights. So like I said, the chapter steering committee, the CHAC steering committee is looking at a way to be as apolitical as possible. Next slide, please. So do you, do you actually want to take discussion on, the, on this particular point at this, at this time, or do you want to take the discussion on this at the end? I wouldn't mind if anyone wants to take the discussion at this point. Let, let's I'm bring this. Bring the slide back then. And I, I really want to call out uh, your last point there. Um, in, in any case where a chapter formation is not possible, if, uh, it's really important for us to find other ways uh, for the individuals in, in uh, the possible situation uh, to participate in, in the internet society. And I think in, in many of these situations where it is not clear uh, whether a state has been formed according to the ISO uh, 3166 process, uh, what we would prefer to do is to encourage those individuals to participate in ISOC in ways that don't actually re require them to spend a lot of their time trying to argue about that point, but get on with trying to, to grow the internet. Um, and in many ways, uh, I think that, that that process is a distraction uh, from our actual mission. Uh, it's clearly not our mission to help identify what states exist in the world. Um, so if there's other things in particular you feel that we ought to encourage uh, staff to do um, or programs that need that need for those who are stateless or who are in this condition, uh, advice from the CHAC on that point would be welcome. Thank you for the response, Ted. I'll take that into my, I'll take that to the chapter steering committee. Well, well so this is Andrew Sullivan. Um, the, the way chapters are defined right now, uh, statelessness is not a thing that we could support because chapters, the, the way this is stated in the in the chapter principle uh, is um, uh, through a presence local to its community of interest. A chapter focuses on issues and developments important to its community. So you could talk about a stateless community in a given location but it has to be in a location. There's a ge geographic principle here that is part of chapters. And if it's non-geographic, that's what a SIG is. So so uh, I'm sorry that I was unclear. What I was trying to get at was uh, if there were programs needed to accommodate these folks as individual members, oh, I see. Um, parallel to the programs available to chapters, uh, that would be something that we can do because those individual members do not have this chapter uh, locality question. Um, so I think that that was my point, and I apologize that it was not clear. Luis? Yes, Luis yeah. Martinez. The, okay. Something that I have observed is that uh, many chapters that do not, or many individuals that do not have a regional presence or a local presence, they sometimes try to adhere to another chapter. And the tendency, at least what I see in Latin, in, in Latin America, is to avoid other uh, members from not from the country to get into the chapter. Now, long time ago, it, it 
happened a lot that maybe you were in Dominican Republic and you joined the Puerto Rico chapter. But now these days, because of uh, many changes in rules, in uh, financial rules, or maybe regarding to charity organizations, the, the, uh, these uh, foreigner uh, members are sent off to their countries again. So maybe we need to find another uh, method to have these members from uh, a place where there is no uh, internet to join either, I'm thinking about the International Olympic Committee, the uh, under a flag in Switzerland or the uh, any other uh, way to join ISOC without joining uh, a specific chapter. So, so we can already do that, right? That both through the SIG mechanism and and as individual members. And I think that uh, uh, there's been work going on, as as we're all aware, for a long time to revamp the membership systems. And hopefully, with those new systems, uh, our ability to interact with the individual members will increase, um, even if they're not part of a, a specific chapter. It, it's also the case that the um, the, the rules about who may join a given chapter are entirely under the control of that chapter. They're, they're not one of the things that we specify. Um, so there are lots of chapters that permit non-local membership. Um, uh, if I recall correctly, the New York chapter, Washington chapter, and the Hong Kong chapter are all, are all chap examples of chapters that will allow you to join. Whether Hong Kong still allows that, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so, so this is a um, th th this is really up to the rules of the local chapter, and as you say, that might be constrained by lo local banking regulations and so forth. Um, uh, there are lots of reasons why um, you know why those things could be and and so for instance, there are while the New York chapter just to pick on it um, uh, permits non-local membership and in fact foreign membership like you know non-U.S. membership not every foreign national would be eligible for membership in the New York chapter because of US rules. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we can probably move on from this point now. Um, so if you want to go to your next slide, Adabun. Okay, thank you so much for the contribution. Like I said, I'll be taking this to the council uh, for further discussions. We really appreciate it. Okay, so we're having our next um, council, uh, all chapter advisory council members meeting. Uh, 15th of November, and if you decide to take a, you know, a look at the list, um, you will find on this slide uh, the links. Next slide, please. Okay, so here I say big thank you. Um, thank you for discussing particularly the issue of um, chapter formation. Um, perhaps before I take my, before I drop my uh, page, I should state this clearly, uh, for, for some of us in some other parts of the country, for example, I'm resident in Nigeria, and I'm also a member of the US and Kenya uh, ISOC uh, group. Uh, I would love to you know, take that on my shoulders, but the question bothers more about, what about my rights to have my own sovereignty? How do I decide? Uh, who helps me to decide? If I cannot have my own chapter, ISOC chapter, in the name I decide that I want to uh, have it. This is a take home. This is not uh, open for discussion. It's a take home for all of us here on the board to consider. Because at the back of the individual's mind, he or she believes strongly that if the internet is for everyone and I come online, then my takeaway should be the fact that if I say I'm this country and my country believes that it can stand alone, I think the best place to look for support would be on the internet itself. How we finally, how we finally address this situation would help us uh, rather than again, you know, using the word, keeping it in a stateless uh, state by advising such individual members to actually participate fully in other organizations, other platforms, other chapters. Do not forget we have a chapter for galactical uh, members. Uh, which means you could also be, you know, outside the earth and still be a member of the Internet Society. On that note, for the records, I give me a for the Chapter Advisory Council. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Are there questions or comments from the board? Please. Thank you, Ted. Uh, thank you, Adenbumi. Adenbumi. Yes, the, um, this is Luis. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, what can you comment on current elections at the, uh, the CHAC? Yes, uh, how's the process going? Uh, how many seats are going to be changed or if there are any seats to be changed? And the other one is related to the role of CHAC as a bridge between the chapters and the board of trustees. Yes, the, uh, when the CHAC was created, it, it, it was thought to be a good medium to connect the chapters with the board of trustees. And I'm not sure this has happened efficiently, at least. So uh, I was expecting this, in this report to read more about uh, not only the communication between chapters or between the international organizations and the chapters, but how about the chapters and the rest of ISOC? Yes, the, uh, I don't see in the report these sort of communications. So I just would like to know if there is a plan or you feel it's okay the way uh, the CHAC is acting towards communication for the internal organization at large. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis, for that question. Um, perhaps it was uh, our own undoing not to, uh, to have left out elections uh, in the report, my apologies on behalf of my um, board. And also communications, communication is actually very key. And that is actually what we are working on at the moment. Um, not to stay the honest net, not to stay in the honest net. Uh, some of our members believe strongly that uh, we should, as um, a steering committee, be asking more questions. If possible, be doing a flashback to past issues. For example, the, state, the sales of uh, PIR, and all other issues that we believe are of concern to them. However, we believe strongly that we should be looking forward to, first of all, uh, addressing the issue of our, our members see the chapter advisory council. Uh, we're still in that discussion at our next meeting on the 15th of November, which is one of our major discussion uh, put up on for the open mic for people to discuss how they see the chapter advisory council and how they want the chapter advisory council to run. That being said, uh, bringing back uh, to the elections issues, at the moment, um, we, we are running the elections very, very um, smoothly. Apologies. We are running the elections very smoothly. Uh, the chapter advisory council was able to appoint uh, a chairman for the elections committee, who happens to be the outgoing secretary of uh, the current chapter advisory council. As it is the law, as it is in the bylaws, it is statutory for all the nine seats to be changed. Uh, we do not have a, a sitting bow out uh, procedure. All nine seats will be changed. At the moment, all of us are up for election. And those of us who wish to probably have a comeback, probably to you know, volunteer to serve, have put in uh, our applications and uh, have gone through the process of, uh, we've finished the process of, um, campaign on, uh, on November 10, campaign ceased and uh, elections have commenced. By the 25th, election would have uh, been concluded and the results will be out. Uh, so that said for the elections, and you know, without much ado about nothing, yes, the chapter advisory council would look ahead towards having pockets of meeting with the board of trustee uh, prior to dates. It would go a long way to address a lot of issues, uh, you know, you know, in the idea of communication. Uh, probably we have been um, sent back a little based on the accident uh, that got our chairman involved, and we've not been able to have uh, much discussions around certain things. That we have been able to move forward basically uh, because of um, um, reporting. Let me use that word: reporting based on the number of chapter members who actually uh, function in different working groups. We hope to work on that. If I come back, yeah, um, those are gonna be issues that we're gonna be addressing. If I do not come back, uh, the minutes of meeting will state clearly, these are the challenges we need to address. 
having to have more than one you know, meeting with the board of trustees, having to have a series of feedbacks from the board of trustees to the chapters and also the SIGs. I hope that answers your question, Louis. And thank you so much for that question. Thank you very much for the response. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate it and we appreciate uh, the continued efforts of the CHAC to work for the mission of the society. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Okay, um, we are running a little bit ahead and it looks like the folks from OMAC and the local chapter uh, have not yet joined us. So I'm gonna ask to bring forward uh, the the item on signature authority. This is uh, something you've seen in the past um, and it should be fairly short. Uh, Ilona, if uh, I believe you said you would be ready to, 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 to present that. Sure. Okay, uh, so uh, my apologies for a little bit of hopscotch with the agenda, but we're just trying to fit that in before the other reports. Okay, so I don't have the slides. Um, I did send an email earlier this week, um, and it um, contains two policies. One is for the Internet Society, one is for the Internet Society Foundation, and it's the policies on the signature authority and authorization. Um, as Andrew mentioned, um, Rinalea and Sally are um, getting promoted to the managing director, and so we had to relook at our policies. So what you have in your emails are the updated policies and because this is the board's um, authority to pass those policies, we ask that you take a look at them and if there's any discussion, or if not, we'll call for the resolution. So this, this was sent out uh, uh, 10 days or so ago at this point, um, and it's fairly similar to the uh, signature authority um, policy we had before with the changes to update uh, to recognize the the new roles for Renalia and Sally. Sally, are there any questions about the policy? Okay, so we'll have to take the two um, policy pieces uh, related to the foundation during the foundation meeting. Um, but functionally, what we're looking for at the moment is to make sure that people are okay with the new policy and uh, with the new delegated authorities table, which is Schedule A in it. Um, I'm not seeing any questions about that. No? Um, so I guess the next question is if we can have the resolution up. Looks like we have it. Um, uh, so the proposed resolution is a resolution for the signature authority and delegation of authority policies, Internet Society. Um, the resolution states adopt updated signature authorization and delegation of authority policy, whereas the Board of Trustees, by a resolution 2021 43, adopted a signature authorization and delegation of authority policy, whereas the Board of Trustees desires to update the policy, resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby adopts the updated signature authorization and delegation of authority policy as presented. Uh, we'll take the Internet Society Foundation one during its thing, but are there any, is there any discussion of the resolution? Uh, seeing none, uh, may I ask you to raise your hand either in person or in the tool to signify assent. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much. I believe that's unanimous. So the, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we just, have, we, we just approved the signature, um, uh, policy changes that, that you've seen in the email. Okay. Uh, so the, the foundation uh, meeting will have a very similar short section to, the, to disclose that. And I guess the next question, uh, do we have the OMAC folks that have joined us? Not yet. Okay, we're expecting the local chapter uh, at the bottom of the hour, which would be 10.30 local time here. So we'll take a short break till then. If we could pause the recording.
Uh, welcome, Olivier. Uh, we're thankful that you were able to join us today, and we look forward to your report. Please take it, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll just turn my camera. I hope you can hear me well. Um, thank you, and welcome to London. Uh, I guess we are, uh, I, I can't say we're your local host because I'm not actually local, unfortunately. Um, I would have uh, wanted to, to join you guys, but I'm currently in Albania. I actually arrived from Turkey a couple of days ago, and so uh, a, a bit far away. Christian Larinaga is in Bath, uh, but he, he only for a short while and couldn't make it to London. We're, we're a bit scattered at the moment uh, around the globe, but this is what the internet helps us do, uh, which is to work remotely and be able to uh, uh, continue running the chapter from wherever we are in the UK or abroad, which is uh, uh, a, a good thing. Now, um, the, I think the last time you guys uh, came to London was, uh, was it four years ago, five years ago? It was a, a little while ago, and we had some events that took place uh, back then. We managed to organize some events with the government, and uh, unfortunately, you, you come in at a time when the, the, the government changes uh, on quite a regular basis in the UK, so organizing things has been particularly challenging, and for us, it's been particularly challenging to um, also organize other events because whenever we wanted to have uh, ministers or, or people in the in the uh, proposing policy and so on, uh, things uh, uh, you know, the goalposts have kept on moving uh, for for quite some time, uh, and we always thought that there would be uh, another day, uh, maybe wait another month for a little bit more stability, and then we would be able to get a, a nice good stable panel and develop the discussions and things um, were always pushed back. Anyway, um, in the past years, uh, well, I, I, I think I've noticed a number of you around the table are new. I, I do have to congratulate uh, one of uh, one person in particular, that's Joe Sadowski on, on his uh, uh, achievement, uh, the Jonathan Postel Award. So well, well done, George. I was thrilled. To, uh, to watch the recordings uh, of the, the proceedings uh, on your uh, award ceremony. Um, but um, I think I know a few other people around the table, um, and uh, I'm not sure to what extent you know the, 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 the background of uh, the UK chapter, or UK England chapter of the Internet Society. It started in the late 90s uh, as ISOC London chapter, and then it was expanded uh, as uh, ISOC England uh, chapter, uh, because at the time there was an ISOC Scotland chapter, and uh, there were discussions to have also an ISOC, uh, uh, another chapter in the other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, the Scottish chapter uh, faded away, and we ended up being the only chapter covering the whole of the UK, uh, thus being called I ISOC UK England, which is a little strange for some, because they're, they're, some don't know the, quite the difference between the two, but it's UK England, uh, and uh, it's been going since the, the late 90s, 1999, I think, was the time when Kristen Larinaga uh, uh, expanded it to, the, to, to this. Um, we have about um, 1,700 or so members listed, but as with any chapter, uh, they don't all take an active part in the running of the, the chapter, so we do have a nice footprint, uh, being able to disseminate information to a large number of people. But as of the active members, you, you find there's a much, much smaller set of people that are uh, involved in both the discussions on our policy mailing list, but also the discussions that take place um, when we have either face-to-face -face meetings or uh, webinars. We do have a, uh, a lack of face-to-face -face meetings in the past years because of COVID, of course. And the UK was particularly badly hit. Uh, so people are generally more reticent these days to actually go to face to face meetings. Uh, and they, they really enjoy the, the idea of uh, being able to have uh, um, in face, well, not face to face, but uh, online meetings using Zoom. And, and that's been very well accepted. So the last year, we had uh, one hybrid event, uh, which was the, with the British Computing Society. Um, and it was about the threat to DNS, uh, and uh, we, we had two aspects of this, one being the technical threats, uh, including the DOH and the, the, the needs for, for IoT, uh, the potential architectural changes for 5G, but also the political threats 
uh, such as nationalization of uh, DNS uh, resources and, and other uh, uh, moving goalposts that we see in the, on the policy side of things. We also had, a, a, and that was a hybrid event. So we had a few people that turned up and, and it was interesting to see that we had more people online than people coming to the face-to-face -face meetings. While in the past, this was completely different. We had more people at the face-to-face -face meeting than, than online. Um, the other event we had last year was, uh, uh, another interesting event we had last year was rebuilding and enha enhancing trust in algorithms. Um, the, the chapter has maintained an interest in algorithm diversity and algorithm neutrality for quite some time. Uh, and and <laughs> the, the lack of neutrality is, is one of the things. So it's more like algorithmic bias uh, uh, of some sort. And we have worked with uh, um, uh, Ansgar Kerner uh, and his uh, uh, group of researchers um, with a, an EPSRC, so it's a sort of a research grant uh, funded called Reentrust, a follow up uh, to a previous projects in the previous years uh, at the University of Oxford, Edinburgh, and Nottingham. And the, 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 the uh, 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 things that were discussed there and, and that were uh, studied were what are the user expectations and requirements? Uh, regarding the rebuilding of trust in algorithms. A few years ago, the question was, do people have trust in algorithms? The, the answer now is no, they don't, uh, because they feel, uh, of course, due to the advent of uh, fake uh, information and uh, the, the whole uh, discussion that takes place about uh, people being in their own bubbles and so on. Um, and so more transparency is required in, in those algorithms. And the question is, how can one create that transparency? So this group was really uh, has done some serious and, and very deep work on this. Uh, and to what extent the, the user trust can be regained uh, through techno technological solutions or through some way to show that algorithms can be trusted. Um, with the with the uh, limitations that we have today, where most of the companies that use these algorithms are saying this is proprietary information, so they can't actually share what exactly the algorithm does, because obviously that's that's um, that, that that that's the way they, they see it, and that's their worth. So that's that's the stuff that we had last year. Now, of course, we also had a process which is a long-standing process that we thought was going to be much shorter than this on the UK online, when well, it started as online harms. Um, it started in, in uh, uh, way before uh, May 2021, where in the, we had early signs that such a, a bill was coming up. Now, for those that don't know it, the online harms bill, which in fact now has been renamed online safety bill, aims to make the UK internet the safest in the world. Where, where, and we're, we're thinking, well, okay, it's safest, fair enough, but safest for who and for what? And what do you mean by making the internet the safest in the world? The main flaw with this bill is that it paints with a single stroke pretty much the whole, what we would uh, call technologically as the, the, the stack, uh, uh, all, from, the, from the, the lower layers all the way to the application layer and um, is, is uh, imposing a whole number of, of rules and of uh, uh, recommendations that require tracking, that require recording, that require uh, a full uh, analysis of traffic, um, and uh, that, that effectively uh, have a number of uh, unwanted, uh, unwanted um, um, consequences. That's the word, unwanted consequences, such as, for example, the weakening of encryption. Um, there was a recent debate, actually, regarding this online safety bill uh, at the UK IGF, which took place uh, just, I think it was last week. And it was interesting to see how far apart the sides are, where the proponents and the supporters of the online safety bill are saying one thing and saying, no, it doesn't weaken encryption, it's not a backdoor, it's not none of what you're accusing it to be, but at the same time, it has all the flavors of that, because they're saying that's what, well, what, what it needs to do is something, and when they explain it, it basically is what they say it isn't. Um, so it's, it's a complicated one, and uh, we have been, uh, of course, working very hard with the Internet Society uh, uh, as well, with, with the help of, of staff, uh, to try and bring uh, some sense into this debate and to try and, and 
move away from the emotions and actually have some technological questions and answers and proposals in order to to have a bill that is not going to start breaking things and start having creating more harm than it actually is supposed to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, preventing uh, end users from so that was one of that that's one of the ongoing issues and it's not finished yet the bill still hasn't passed in parliament we had some prime ministers that wanted it done within a couple of weeks and others slowed it down and of course then the political debate went elsewhere and so there's still a, a part that one can play the difficulty being though that we are up against a highly emotional um, set of um, uh, of arguments uh, that are basically saying well are, are you know children are being abused and child sexual abuse material is available online and terrorists and, and, and all these people are making use of the internet in a certain way. And this bill is going to be the one that, that saves us all from all of this material and, uh, and makes the internet, the UK internet much, much safer. So, so can I drill down on this point a, a little bit, because I know yeah. this is of interest uh, to, to the board. Um, clearly the, the bill as it's currently written has a number of concerning uh, elements, two of which I think you already touched on, and I wanted to kind of get a little bit of discussion around. One is encryption. It looks uh, in the bill right now as if it is an, if an offense under the bill to turn over material to Ofcom, uh, which has been encrypted, which functionally means many service providers uh, that would normally be cooperative, uh, which no longer have access to unencrypted versions of traffic. Um, uh, if they turn over the encrypted versions as a response to an Ofcom uh, inquiry would be uh, chargeable uh, as offenders under the bill, which certainly seems like um, it's highly problematic uh, given the current mix of traffic on the internet uh, and the fact that the providers themselves don't control that, right? I mean, it's, a, it, it, it's something where the encryption takes place between an end user device and uh, a service, which neither of which may be under the control of the provider. The other of which is the uh, is the elements that Ofcom is, will be charged with for verification of identity. Um, and there's a great right. deal of concern, um, especially the category one providers who must verify identity, not simply that someone is an adult, but the identity associated with the adult. Um, how is that debate going uh, from your perspective on those two elements? And, and what do you think that means for how the, the internet, can the internet be for everyone if the internet must always be attributable? There's a big question there. Unfortunately, you're, you're absolutely right, Ted. And uh, unfortunately, the debate, um, and you will, I don't know whether you've seen that discussion at the UK IGF, but the debate was a, a little bit like seeing two sides that are saying their points, but not meeting in the middle. And, and uh, Alec Muffet was the gentleman who, who made the points that you made and others. Um, one of the points being, well, if the UK implements such a system, um, what stops uh, another country like, uh, well, a country that is less democratic than the UK implementing exactly the same thing and using it to actually um, uh, control their people? And, uh, and the answer is where, well, oh, that, that, that goes beyond the debate that we need to have here. It's a case of, well, you know, we're going to create something, but we don't really want to know what, it, what it's going to cause. And, and the consequences of what we're creating here. The other thing that came out of that discussion, and it is, by the way, the first one that has that I felt was one that was balanced, because often you get people from the same side. The chapter tried to organize a discussion with the different parties in the early part of the year, and we were unable to do so. Whenever one side heard, oh, they are, they're part of it, oh, no, well, no, we don't really want to engage into a discussion here about this. We want to engage in, in a discussion about this in Parliament or in other fora, but not in a forum that is outside the, the realm of, of Parliament. And this is the problem when you've got the technologists that understand what they're talking about. They're not able to actually access, to directly access a debate with people that are of enough, um, uh, of a certain level uh, to be able to make changes in the policy itself. What transpired, it appears, from the discussions at the IGF, at the UK IGF, was that we're going to pass the bill, and yes, it's got a lot of problems with it, 
And when we'll implement it, we'll see what works and we'll see what won't work. And I personally find this flabbergasting uh, to, to put together a policy where there is a question mark as to whether it will actually be implementable in the way that the policy is, is drafted. It's very disappointing to see something like this where you're going to end up with or you you're very likely now to end up at this stage with a piece of legislation that is not going to be fit for purpose and that is going to cause all sorts of additional problems i don't know if anyone else has a has a comment on this or, or thought about this but and i'm just sharing my personal views i haven't had a chance to discuss it with my colleagues in in, in iso uk but i know that several have have also emitted deep deep concerns about this being some some very flawed piece of policy that is just being pushed through for political reasons because we need to do something and um and then they can just put us oh tick the box we've now made the internet safe so well if only if if all it really took was ticking a box to make the internet safe we'd have done it a long time ago <laughs> as, 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 uh, pepper yeah so oh yeah um hello I, mean, I would agree completely, and actually it's worse than that because there's a contagion factor, because the UK is seen as, you know, uh, you know, the, one of the better countries for evidence-based rulemaking, evidence-based legislation, and this is clearly not evidence-based. Um, and so for those countries where it's even less well-intended, um, you know, it's going to be used as a reason to, frankly, try to fragment the internet, break it down, and and create, um, uh, in the in the name of security, safety, protecting children, um, you, you know, uh, um, you know, digital sovereignty, and we're going to see this as you know used in many places for you know, um, not so well intended reasons, even if here. It's completely ill-informed. Um, at least it's to some extent well-intended, and so I think that, that we do have to worry about the contagion factor. Hi, John Peterson. I mean, it, is it our assessment that it is merely ill-informed and not well, that there's no ulterior motive to this? I mean, that because I mean, I, it seems to me almost impossible that someone could really think that this is going to work if unless they have a level of ignorance that I would not even ascribe to a cabinet minister, right? So like, well, yeah, I have seen the government, it's, it's, yes. So, but... so this is the, 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 the issue and Oliver, you know, you can, you know, uh, okay. um, sorry. Because I can the, certainly you know, imagine it's, a set it's of... the political, so this is the issue where you have um, politics, not policy. And it's, it's um, the goals are, again, we have to do something, so we're going to do something. But but we don't think there's an ulterior motive to actually create a splinter net in the UK behind this, right? That is merely using this. I, as I, a would, I, would, I would I would yeah, that's, that's my question. And yeah. I don't Jeffrey, believe yes. that's the case. I we do don't believe that's the case. And, and, no, I, I don't believe that's the case okay, at just all. Ignorance. It's just an unintended consequence. And no matter how much we mention this unintended consequence, there are it falls on deaf ears because of the emotional debate from the other side, the, the very strong lobbying that has taken place, not just recently, but for many, many years to say we need to make sure that now we make the Internet safe and safe means whatever it means. I mean, OK, it means basically uh, stopping any kind of traffic that might be that will be considered harmful to specific segments of UK society and that of course includes hate speech etc that includes a whole lot of, uh, of things not just child sexual abuse material but it's the, 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 the thing is some seem to think that there's a silver bullet you do something and then it will be safe and that's where there's a deep flaw unfortunately the politics in the UK right now work a little bit like this where we need a silver bullet in order to be able to, um, you know, make stay in power for a little more time. There's so much chaos at the moment. We need to show that we care and that we're doing something and that previous governments have not. Yeah, John, uh, Laura, to, to your Laura, point. Pepper, Laura is next. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Pe Pepper, the, Laura is next. Yeah, sorry, this we'll is, come back, come back okay. to you, I promise. Okay. If what you're saying is relevant to the current point, please continue. Go ahead. No, I was just going to respond to John um, that the official UK government position at the IT plenipotentiary was to oppose Splinternet, was to oppose data localization, 
So at the <laughs> government level, right, among the, you know, the, the FCO people, I mean, the people who actually understand these things was to strongly oppose those kinds of efforts um, and along with, you know, the US and others and were effective in pushing back on those, those efforts. So I actually don't think it's intended, ill, Ill intended. Um, in that sense, but there's, it's politics, not policy. So we'll chime in there. I think my perception of this issue here is that I don't think any of these folks in government understand the concept of small internet, right? Like, I don't think they know what they're doing, essentially. And then my question um, for you, Olivier, is what can we do to support you in this? Because it seems like I think we're all pretty much in agreement that this is a terrible idea and will have terrible consequences, but I'm not really, I don't think any of us really know how to move it forward in a more positive direction. Yeah, thank you. I, I think you should just keep on doing what you've been doing so far. You've really been very supportive of the chapter and, and of course with your bilateral discussions uh, independently of, of the chapter through the connections that you have um, in, in being able to engage with the uh, uh, with those concerned in the, with the policymakers, but as as um, as Pepper says, there's a lot of politics in this now, and we are faced with some uh, public servants that are basically saying, "I'm sorry, at the moment I can't do anything. I'm told we have to go this way, and you know, I know we were saying the opposite before, and and this is where then the discussion goes into the bill will be voted, and at implementation, it will have to be changed or, you know, it, it will it will have to see if it can can be implemented or not and how it can be implemented. And there'll be, a, I, I would imagine, there'll be a lot of discussions with the, it's all about social media, really, with the main social media companies, the likes of, of you know, the GAF, uh, well, the, uh, yeah, the GAFAs effectively. And um, it's not, it, it's not a, um, um, it's not an accident that, that you actually have such a strong presence of Facebook and Apple and, and, and the, these companies that are heavily involved in content these days uh, based in London, because that obviously is where they're going to have to do a, a significant amount of work. The, the critic, of course, the, the concern is that they might end up with a solution or some middle of the road solution that only they, the big companies, are able to sustain. And any smaller organizations and smaller companies will just not have neither the manpower nor the technology to do. And um, that, of course, is another type of, of uh, splintering or, well, it's more like, uh, uh, not even splintering, I think it, it's, sort of, it's, um, it's basically the, the reducing the number of, of actors that are out there. And, uh, you know, so some sort of, it's not even consolidation because you're basically shedding away uh, wh whoever it is that is not able to follow. Um, and that's a concern that we should have too. But yes, you've done a really great job so far. And I think that if we can continue that dialogue, and of course the chapter will be fully behind the efforts of the Internet Society on, on, on this. And we hope that it'll be the, in the other direction too. Um, I wish some of my colleagues who knew a lot more about this in depth were, were with us. Um, but uh, trust me, this is an issue which we have many, many concerned discussions about with many, many concerned folks around the UK, including people that uh, were previous policymakers and that just don't understand why we are edging towards the, you know, the edge of the precipice when the UK has traditionally been at the forefront of policymaking and support of the multi-stakeholder model, supporter of uh, a, a one internet supporter of all, all the values that the internet society supports. So it's it's quite um, bizarre to be in this situation today, but unfortunately that's that's where we are. It's not the first thing that is bizarre in UK politics at the moment. Uh, so I have Andrew and then Charles. Uh, thanks. So just a couple of items that I, I will point out. Um, we are working, the staff is working um, closely with people in the UK on, on this topic. We co-authored a, a, an impact assessment on the, uh, on the online safety bill. Um, and, and of course, we've, we've been working on these ideas of like digital sovereignty. That report is about to come out. Uh, we, um, you know, we developed the impact briefs precisely so that it was possible to provide these kinds of things so that policymakers would not be able to claim oh, it's just we don't understand this. Um, 
I, I do think there is one other thing that, that is important to recognize here, and that is it's very easy to fall into the habit of thinking of governments as having a unity, um, right? So like, what is the government policy on this? But of course, within a, an organization as large as the UK government, you have factions. And some of those factions are, I, I think John's question was, was appropriate. Some of those factions simply don't care whether they wreck the internet. They're, they're interested in other things, and like if the internet happens to fail, um, either that's like just too bad or for that matter, maybe a good thing because um, what they're really after is sort of more social control or something like that. And I think that we are seeing the emergence of that, like the UK is not in any way unique in that, in that re respect, right? We're seeing that all over the world in places where we used to think, hey, we're, these people are our allies last week. Um, uh, you know, we have to ask ourselves, hey, is this, you know, do we have, the, the kinds of support that we uh, we want. Um, and just to foreshadow a little bit, of course, we will have some more projects on this very topic for next year. So um, when we talk about the action plan for, for next year, uh, I guess tomorrow, um, uh, that will be one of the things that we'll be asking this board to approve to make sure that we can um, you know continue to press forward on this thing because it's an urgent problem. I have Charles and then John. Yeah, I think a few points to add. Uh... For myself, uh, first of all, I think it's not unique to the UK. Definitely, it's very much the same situation in many of the democratic countries around the world, uh, including Australia, including Canada, including the US. Uh, even though probably in the US, the laws were proposed, but they weren't passed yet, or maybe they would never get passed because it is the US. So. Uh, but, uh, uh, or Germany, I mean, the hate speech laws in Germany a few years ago were very well copied by other countries, including Singapore and so on, and expanded on uh, 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 by, you know, countries that are less democratic. So this is a, it, an issue that has been around for a long time. And so I, I, I think the situation in the UK is definitely not unique. But I also want to point out another fact to consider, which is that uh, when we talk about the internet, uh, uh, the concept of the internet to us is very different from the concept of the internet for many of the lawmakers uh, and politicians. To them, the internet is Facebook, Google, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, to them, this is evil. Uh, a, they equate the internet with those companies uh, or, the, or you know, some of those uh, factors that are represented by some of the behaviors of these com companies. So I think that is also one, 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 one issue that we need to try to explain better to the uh, globe, to the wider community, including policymakers, that the internet isn't about those companies alone. Right. John? Yeah, just a clarifying question, maybe even a question about Ofcom's remit, but do we anticipate the, the offenders from whom they would be trying to seize data in this instance would be more the, the Vodafone, right, that this is connected to, or Apple? Like, is there anything in the legislation that would lead us to think this is a way they're going to pressure operators to give this, or is it really the, the metas, right, and the Apples and the Googles that, does anybody know? Olivia, do you want I, I think that that, uh, that Charles uh, uh, put his his uh, um, you know his finger on it. Uh, I don't think they even go to that level. They just see it as social media, Facebook. Right. But I was talking about Ofcom's remit in particular. So does oh, yeah, Ofcom yeah, yeah. have the same regulatory power over Meta that it does over Voda? Well, what, once it goes into a bill, it's not down to the agency that actually is oh, proposing okay. the bill. It's then it becomes law. Then it's I, I don't know what agency. I mean, I, I know you called out Ofcom, Ted, in the passage you were reading, which is why I was asking that much more narrow question. Yeah, I mean, Ofcom's remit has expanded over the years. Okay. It used to be just uh, Oftel telephone services. Then it became Ofcom with all sorts of things that were added to this. And uh, and now it seems that they're expanding their remit. Now they're, they're you know the people at Ofcom are actually very reasonable people, but it's just you know the pressures, the outside pressures from the likes of GCHQ, the likes of those other pressure groups that are saying, no, no, we need something much stronger than this, and and you you are the people that have to to uh, to push this forward. But you know I, I should emphasize the whole point, which I find absurd, which is let's implement this flawed bill. And sorry, let's pass the bill and then we'll think about implementation. And if it's not implementable, well, we'll have to find a solution. That doesn't sound like 
proper policy making. That, that's the big concern that we have, because it might be the first of a number of other bills also that then will be passed this way, and even more restrictive. A few years ago, we had the regulation of investigatory, investigatory powers bill, which was also something that had some, some parts of it that went way further than we'd ever seen before. One of them being that an internet service provider needs to coordinate the work with a security agency to be able to hack into somebody's computer they're not allowed to tell the person that they're doing this, and uh, the government is there allowed to go in there, take information, remove information from your machine if it has, if it manages to, to have access to it. Something that would never be allowed in the real world without a warrant is something that could be allowed in the, um, in, in the virtual world. And the question is, has it been used since? Probably not, probably not possible technologically these days because people implement their own firewalls on their machines. But, you know, this is it's, it's part of a, a set of bills that are supposed to make the landscape lot, a lot clearer than what it is with the multiplication of small bills that were voted over the years. And yet it's actually not making it clearer. It's actually making it a lot cloudier and, and a lot, no pun intended, by the way, but um, a lot a lot worse than what it's supposed to be. And um, it, it just leaves us as a, a community of, of people who know their way around technology baffled as to what the intent is at the end. Although we don't think there is malicious intent, there appears to be some way of, oh, well, let's have more control from a certain part of the political field. And, uh, and they're seeing this as an opportunity for them to, to have that added, uh, that added control over information. And that's a concern as well. Uh, and to give you kind of a more direct answer, I've, I've put something into into the board chat that uh, gives you a pointer to the bill. And on page 70, you'll see how Ofcom assesses uh, each different ones of these so that on, under part three, for example, search engines are included. Clearly not Vodafone at that level, combined services, user to user services, et cetera. So the remit is definitely different. And it's interesting because DCMS, which is the, the group that actually is the sponsoring ministry for this, uh, in many other ways has very sensible ideas about the internet. And I think um, perhaps the message we have to, to give to, to pick up on something that Olivier said before is uh, silver bullets are for werewolves. And of all the problems the internet has, lycanthropy really not one of them. Um, we really have to get them to understand that uh, this is significantly more complex than uh, any silver bullet will ever address. And that some of this uh, extension of power, once extended, is impossible to retrieve. Um, I think the, the point that Olivier made before about um, the law being passed and then in implementation changed is a significant departure from the rule of law. It's not simply a problematic for uh, the internet, it's problematic for the entire system of the rule of law to have the government say, we'll pass something that's incredibly broad and then work out later how it applies to the actual lives of its citizens, because that then becomes a matter of government intent rather than the rule of law given the possibility of government intent shifting over time, as it certainly has uh, from government to government, even in a country as stable as the UK, that's problematic for us. The other thing that's incredibly problematic is the point uh, Charles was making, that these things are written with Twitter in mind. And we're currently seeing Twitter dissolve into a whole bunch of other services that might not meet the threshold um, that this currently implies because it's built with thresholds in mind of who has to comply. And you know, if you're now in a federated system like Mastodon or one of the possible replacements that does this, nothing might apply. And the entire intent of the bill to try and make sure that there is a way to see whether a service is being used to disseminate hate speech or child sexual content or something like that disappears because the bill was written um, to the incumbents rather than to the actual underlying systems. And I think it's, it's, it's problematic on so many different ways. I'm incredibly grateful for the work that the staff is doing on it, um, but I think that the board has to be ready uh, from the point of view of defend, which we've discussed in the past, that more and more um, folks that we saw as allied with our intent and our efforts on the government sphere may no longer, uh, if they're not actually adversaries, they're no longer allies. And that's 
that's the situation we have to deal with. Charles. Just one quick point. Uh, talking about uh, the political side about this whole thing and uh, building allies, I'm, I'm sort of thinking that uh, we can expand a bit more on the uh, uh, on the aspect and the point about uh, censorship and and that sort of implication uh, 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 if such kind of laws are passed uh, with the hope of solving one particular or few problems such as hate speech or or sex or, 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 or child porn uh, materials and so on but having the side effect on uh, some other the other countries so realizing that there are other factions in governments uh, or the legislature and so on, or the political parties that are more concerned actually about the issues of censorship in other countries, could be Iran, could be Russia, China, and so on. Uh, realizing that, you know, trying to let those factions understand the side effects and, and, and so on, so that they might be also a kind of, you know, uh, when the whole discussion are going through the legislature and the government, you know, we could have those fashion factions coming out at a uh, at the right time, hopefully, to 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 counterbalance the sort of uh, uh, push from the uh, from the people that are concerned about the most populous issues like child porn and so on. So I'm afraid we drilled down uh, so far into this that it's going to be a little bit hard to get back to the rest of your presentation. But Olivier, if you if you want to continue now, well, thank you. Uh, well, just just a couple more more mundane matters, I guess. Uh, the uh, I was going to talk briefly about the IPv6 matrix. I, I think you, some of you might be aware of it. It's this uh, website and and uh, crawler that crawls the the world's uh, one million largest information servers and checks for IPv6 connectivity. Uh, we were running it for 10 years uh, on a very old, old set of servers, which finally gave up uh, on life. And uh, we had to revive them uh, in the middle of COVID. Uh, we managed to extract them. They, they were running at the University of Southampton. And thanks to some heroic work by the people over there in um, going around the uh, the bans on being able to even get out of your house, uh, they managed to take those servers out, send them over to London. We took the information out and we've now fully virtualized them, uh, having done a, a deal with a, a, having a, found a, a sponsor for the virtualization uh, engine uh, for the hosting, uh, basically in, in, the, uh, in Mythic Beasts. They're very, um, they were very kind to, uh, when they saw one of our presentations say, oh, we'd, we'd be interested in hosting this. And so they're providing the space. Uh, we got a, um, we received a large grant award uh, to be able to uh, basically rewrite the software because it was written on an operating system that was more than 10, 10 years old. So you can imagine uh, the number of security holes in the operating system. Uh, and of course, the, the big problem being that the libraries were, had to all be updated, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it's back in, it's back up and it's running uh, every month and it's, um, uh, you can go to ipv6matrix.org and you'll see the, the results. We haven't changed the interface, we just kept it to what it was, but the information is pretty much the same. And the crawler was completely rewritten from scratch and we were happy to find out that the results continued in the, in the, in the correct line. So <laughs> there was no big error or mistake or, or something that had gone wrong in the uh, in the version one that dated from i think it was 2010 uh, which in internet terms is probably a lifetime um, so that's that's still running and then we've also got a, a lecture uh, uh, an online webinar coming up uh, with something a little bit different uh, jesse sowell from ucl uh, researcher at ucl is um, going to speak to us on thursday the 17th of november about the operational infra complex of the internet and, and here he's digging into the complex relationships between different companies that are providing you this internet service whether it's at the uh, connectivity level or it's actually at a higher level as you know there's a there's the the web itself but there's a, a web of companies that work with each other that exchange information about you sometimes with contracts and sometimes without contracts and um, He's certainly doing some research and digging into this. And it's, again, another fascinating thing because it's 
I guess, another aspect of what we call the internet ecosystem. We're well knowledgeable about the internet ecosystem when it comes down to internet governance. But here it's about internet commerce and how, how uh, the internet actually is, is funded and funds itself. And I guess as we now reach the uh, a point in time when there are some major changes, and uh, you might have all read that recently, that advertising is, is, is um, uh, not bringing as much, uh, as much money as it used to before to those big, big organizations. And there certainly have, uh, there are some cuts that have uh, affected a number of the big companies out there. Uh, it, it's it would it's interesting to uh, dig into the actual way of how the whole ecosystem works together. Anyway, I know very little about it, but Jesse knows a, a, an enormous amount, so I invite you, uh, and I will um, make an announcement. I think probably later uh, today or tomorrow about the the webinar on Thursday. I invite you to uh, take part into it and uh, learn along along with me. Perhaps some of you know know more than I do. So anyway, that's all really uh, for the chapter. Uh, as I said, I'm really sorry that none of us were able to meet with you in person, uh, but we are looking forward to uh, to a future time. The IETF will be in town again. I'm sure that there'll be a, a future occasion. By then, I probably won't be the chair anymore. I've been chair for quite some time. We've got elections that are coming up. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm told I might do just another round just to, to make sure the ship sails after the, the rough weather that we've had. Uh, with COVID and, and with all that. Um, but uh, be, beyond this, uh, I'm open to any other questions. Thank you. Well, thank you again for, for being here today. Are there any other questions for Olivier? Luis? Yes, thank Olivier, this is Luis. Uh, we have heard a lot of strengthen the internet, but what about grow the internet in the UK? Uh, there's, there's still challenges that are seen from the chapter here uh, uh, in growing the internet apart from the critical infrastructure. Are we looking still to uh, of areas that should be connected to the internet? Maybe the North, the Highlands or something like that? Orkney Islands, you know, <laughs> Shetland. Thank you very much, Luis. Actually, yes, thank you for pointing this out, because that's one point which we, we did have a, a, a discussion about also internally. Uh, the UK has or had a broadband plan. I think it was Boris Johnson that had uh, a few years ago uh, come up with a broadband plan where there was going to be fiber to X number of homes and you know very, very high percentages and so on. Unfortunately, it hasn't lived up to its hype, and so we're still far away from those numbers. There are still some parts of the country that are in actual black holes where there's no fiber, very little copper, um, which is a, a, a difficulty, or at least the, the, the speed on ADSL or XDSL, whatever DSL type it is, is very low. And even black spots when it comes down to mobile connectivity. Uh, 3G is sometimes 3G, not four, three, forget about five. 3G is sometimes hard to get by. Uh, I know of at least a couple of friends that, that live in the hills just outside Bath that have such problems. Um, and so it's, uh, and you, so you don't have to go even as far as, it, as the highlands to, uh, to reach this. There is, unfortunately, due to the changes in governments, there doesn't seem to have been a follow up on this. And this is something which there needs to be really a, a follow up on. There is a second problem with UK legislation, which is the very tight legislation around community networks. Uh, in, in some parts of the world, wherever there was a black spot somewhere, people managed to arrange things with each other. And of course, the Internet Society has been a, a really helpful with this as well. I remember the project in Georgia being such an amazing success. Um, and projects, I should say. Um, and, and there have been some uh, of our members that have been interested in implementing community networks. Unfortunately, the legislation around uh, being able to run your own wide area uh, uh, network uh, by being able to just even lay a cable across the street to the other side of the street or actually have a wide area network that is a radio network of some sort. Legislation is so complicated that many have tried and have failed. Um, and because it's, it involves costs, it involves time, it involves uh, talking to not just one agency, but many different actors. And there appears to be no interest in the government, uh, from the government in, uh, in making this easier. 
Uh, so that's why we haven't seen that many successful uh, wide area uh, community networks in the UK. And those that have been implemented were actually usually implemented with the help of a local telecommunication firm that has the actual uh, licensing agreements to be able to do what it, what it needs to do to roll out the network. And that means it's usually been done in built up areas and not in those parts of the UK that are the furthest uh, from uh, the furthest from, from a town center. Victor? You had a question on the, you had mentioned rural access um, for internet. Um, what's the status on utilizing lower band for, for reach in rural areas? Um, is it still in the UK, is use of 600 megahertz still a challenge for the you know um to be to be able to use to, for the, for those reaches is I, is, um, anyway i'll leave it at that yeah thanks victor i i'm i'm going to be frank with you i don't know uh to be honest uh i haven't followed this very closely i know that christian de Larinaga uh, has if you want we can follow up with you afterwards and, and let you know my understanding is that there hasn't been much uh well there hasn't been anything that's helped recently uh, to make things easier. Um, so I, I would have to check for that. Sure, yeah, we could follow up offline, that's no problem. Luis? Yes, thanks, Olivier. So it means that in this uh, previous theme about the digital uh, regulation, may be another obstacle for growing the internet because the uh, you have current regulation that makes very difficult to uh, set up a wireless uh, uh, LAN or uh, AirLAN. And then the um, now if you add these problems with content regulation that the outcome is leader to, then it will mean that it will become very, very difficult to set a legal uh, network working in your community. Uh, do you foresee uh, an advantage in adopting Wi-Fi 6? Because I'm not sure about the status of the UK in uh, towards Wi-Fi 6, but maybe the, the same as uh, the other side of the channel, which may be only the lower part of the band useful as open. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Luis. I, I fear that, unfortunately, the, the debate and the discussions around the online safety bill have pretty much stopped every other discussion out there on the other topics. So it's taken all the air out of the room and everyone's focusing on this. There have been some arguments and, again, political arguments. So we, we here have politicians who have said, well, before trying to make the network safe uh, for children, you should actually try and get all of the children in the UK to be able to access the network, uh, which is what the broadband plan was supposed to be. And that unfortunately isn't the case. But, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the politics is such that they try and find convincing arguments to get more electors, not to actually get things done. Sorry, that's a personal, <laughs> personal point of view. But obviously, the, you know, the, the, uh, I think one of the questions was that was asked during the UK IGF was what are your plans regarding and, and we had the shadow minister that was um, shadow telecom minister that that spoke and the question was what are you, what are your plans, what do you hope in the next 12 months uh, for the UK Internet and the answer was well we hope to get in power so to, to be elected so that, <laughs> that's the first step I guess for politicians not quite the first step for for technologists and policy makers. Um, we're, I think that once the online safety bill is, well, we can't really say the debate will go away, the debate will continue, but there certainly needs to be a lot more discussion on, on the use of Wi-Fi 6, on the use of these bands in the UK to help with community networks and with, with uh, uh, bringing better connectivity to those places that don't have it. As I said, the debate is somewhere else at the moment. It's unfortunate. Thank you, and um, let's hope it's solved soon. Thank you, and thank you again for the presentation. Um, I believe that our colleagues from OMAC did not end up joining us. Is that correct? Okay, uh, so I'll just call the attention of the board then to the board report which they sent, and in particular to its last statement, which is responsive to our request for advice. 
Um, their response there uh, was, with the current threats to the internet in mind, the OMAC would advise the internet society to expand its outreach and advocacy to a larger audience worldwide in order to get them involved in defending the internet for everyone. Organization members are still keen to receive insights on internet policy and regulations, and it will support them in making informed decisions for their organizations and to support the advancement of the internet. With this in mind, the OMAC would suggest to increase insights and knowledge sharing in a simple, concise, and shareable way to grow engagement and support. So are there are there comments on the OMAC uh, thing, Barry? This is Barry Lieber. I, um, yeah, I'm, it's unfortunate that uh, they couldn't get on because I had some couple of questions about that. So I don't know how sensible it is to raise those questions now, but- uh, In case there's discussion on the board, please do. Okay. Um, well, what I what I wanted to ask was um, whether they had any specific angles for the first part of it, the um, uh, expand outreach and advocacy in in what areas, in what regard, um, something more specific than than that very general statement, and um, and and how they thought that we might do it. And the second part is how can we leverage the organization members to accomplish what they're asking in the second paragraph. So, uh, I, I think the proper thing for us to do then is just to take those questions back to them in, in email. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that. Uh, um, Mohammed? Yes, uh, Mohammed Sibir for the record. Uh, yes, adding to uh, what Mary has asked, uh, I would uh, like to ask what specific areas are they looking to uh, for the internet society to give them advice on? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Barry, can you take the token to craft that email, including Muhammad's uh, portion? I, I can, yes. Thank you. Okay, I think that brings us to the close of today's session for the internet society meeting. Uh, before we suspend, is there any other business? Okay, seeing none, we'll suspend the Internet Society meeting until uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. London time. Uh, we'll take a brief break, and then the Internet Society Foundation meeting will begin uh, at 20 till the hour, 1140 here in London. Thank you. <laughs>